this letter that Don, I learn in this letter that Don Pedro of Aragon comes this night to Messina. He is very near by this. He was not three leagues off when I left him. How many gentlemen have you lost in this action? But few of any sort, and none of name. The victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. I find here that Don Pedro hath bestowed much honor on a young foreign team called Claudio. Much deserved on his part and equally remembered by Don Pedro. He hath borne himself beyond the promise of his age, doing in the figure of a lamb the feats of a lion. He hath indeed better bettered expectation than you must expect of me to tell you now. He hath an uncle here in Messina who will be very much glad of it. I have already delivered him letters, and there appears much joy in him, even so much that joy could not show itself modest enough without a badge of bitterness. Did he break into tears? In great measure. A kind overflow of kindness. There are no faces truer than those that are so washed. How much better it is to weep at joy than to joy at weeping. I know I pray you, of... is Signor Montanto returned from the wars or no? I know none of that name, lady. There was none such in the army of any sort. What is he that you... What is he that you ask for, niece? My cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua. Oh, he's returned, and as pleasant as ever he was. He set up his bills here in Messina and challenged Cupid at the flight, and my uncle's fool, reading the challenge, sus subscribed for Cupid and challenged him at the bird bolt. I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? But how many hath he killed? For indeed, I promise to eat all of his killing. Oh, faith, niece, you tax Signor Benedict too much. But he'll meet with you, I doubt it not. He hath done good service, lady, in these wars. You had musty victual, and he hath hoped to eat it. He is a very valiant trencherman. He hath an excellent stomach. And a good soldier, too, lady. And a good soldier to a lady. But what is he to a lord? A lord to a lord, a man to a man, stuffed with all honorable virtues. It is so, indeed. He is no idea less than a stuffed man, but for the stuffing. Well. We are all mortal. You must not, sir, mistake my niece. And there is a kind of merry war betwixt Signor Benedict and her. <laughs> they never meet, but there is a skirmish of wit between them. Alas, he gets nothing by that. In our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off, and now is the whole man governed with one so that if he have wit enough to keep himself warm, let him bear it for a difference between himself and his horse, for it is all the wealth that he hath left to be known a reasonable creature. Who, who is his companion now? He hath every month a new sworn brother. It's possible. Very easily possible. He wears his faith, but as the fashion of his hat, it ever changes with the next block. I see, lady. The gentleman is not in your books. No? and he were, I would burn my study. <laughs> but I, I pray you, who is his companion? Is there no young squarer now that will make a voyage with him to the devil? He is uh, in the company of the right noble Claudio. Oh Lord, he will hang upon him like a disease. He is sooner caught than the pestilence and the taker runs presently mad. God help the noble Claudio. If he have caught the Benedict, it will cost him a thousand pound or be cured. I will hold friends with you, lady. Do, good friend. You will never run mad, niece. <laughs> <laughs> no, not till a hot January. Don Pedro is approached. Good Signor Leonato, uh, you are come to meet your trouble. The fashion of the world is to avoid cost, and you encounter it. Never came trouble to my house in the likeness of your grace. For trouble being gone, comfort should remain. But when you depart from me, sorrow abides and happiness takes its leave. 
you embrace your charge too willingly. I think this is your daughter. Her mother hath many times told me so. <laughs> <laughs> Were you in doubt, sir, that you asked her? Signor Benedict, no, for then were you a child. Oh, you have it full, Benedict. We may guess by what you are being a man. Truly, the lady fathers herself. Be happy, lady, for you are like an honorable father. If Signor Leonato be her father, she would not have his head on her shoulders for all Messina, as like him as she is. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody marks you. What, my dear lady Disdain, are you yet living? Is it possible Disdain should die while she hath such meat food to feed it as Signor Benedict? Courtesy itself must convert to Disdain if you come in her presence. Then is courtesy a turncoat? But it is certain that I am loved of all ladies, only you excepted. And I would, I, I would I could find in my heart that I had not a hard heart, for truly, I love none. A dear happiness to women. They would else have been troubled with a pernicious suitor. I thank God and my cold blood. I am of your humor for that. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. God keep your ladyship still in that mind, so some gentleman or other shall scape a predestinate scratched face. Scratching could not make it worse, and twere such a face as yours were. Well, you are a rare parrot, teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I, I would my horse had the speed of your tongue, and so good a continuer. But keep your way, in God's name I'll have none. You always end with a jade's trick. I know you of old. That is the sum of all, Leonardo. Signor Claudio. Signor Benedict, my dear friend Leonardo hath invited you all. I tell him we shall stay here at least a month, and he heartily prays some occasion may detain us longer. I dare swear he is no hypocrite, but prays from his heart. If you swear, my lord, you shall not be forsworn. Let me bid you welcome, my lord, being reconciled to the prince, your brother. I owe you all duty. I thank you. I am not of many words, but I thank you. Please, if your grace, lead on. Your hand, Leonardo. We will go together. Benedict, didst thou note the daughter of Signor Leonardo? I noted her not, but I looked on her. Is she not a modest young lady? Do you question me as an honest man should do for my simple true judgment? Or would you have me speak after my custom as being a professed tyrant to their sex? No, I, I pray thee, speak in sober judgment. Why? If faith methinks she's too low for a high praise, too brown for a fair praise, and too little for a great praise. Only this commendation I can afford her, that she were any other than she is, she were unhandsome. And being no other but as she is, I do not like her. Thou thinkest I am in sport, I pray thee, tell me truly how thou likest her. Would you buy her that you inquire after her? Could the world buy such a jewel? Yea, and a case to put it into. But speak you this with a sad brow, or do you have the do you play the flouting jack to tell us Cupid is a good hair finder and Vulcan a rare carpenter? Come, in what key shall a man take you to go in the song? In mine eye she is the sweetest lady that ever I looked on. I can see yet without spectacles, and I see no such matter. There's her cousin, and she were not possessed with a fury, exceeds her as much in beauty as doth the first of May, doth the last of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband, have you? I would scarce trust myself, though I had sworn to the contrary, if Hero would be my wife. Is it come to this? In faith, hath not the world one man, but he will wear his cap with suspicion? Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Go to with faith, and thou wilt needs thrust thy neck into a yoke, wear the print of it, and sigh away Sundays. Look, Don Pedro is returned to seek you. What secret hath held you here that you followed not to Leonardo's? I would your grace would constrain me to tell. I charge thee on thy allegiance. 
You hear, Count Claudio? I can keep a secret as a dumb man. I would have you think so, but on my allegiance, mark you this, on my allegiance, he is in love. With who? Now that is your grace's part. Mark how short his answer is. With Hero, Leonardo's short daughter. If this were so, so were it uttered. Like the old tale, my lord. It is not so, nor twas not so, but indeed, God forbid it should be so. If my passion change not shortly, God forbid it should be otherwise. Amen, if you love her. For the lady is very well worthy. You speak this to fetch me in, my lord. By my troth, I speak my thought. And in faith, I, my lord, I spoke mine. And by my two faiths and troths, my lord, I spoke mine. That I love her, I feel. Well, that she is worthy, I know. That I neither feel how she should be loved nor know how she should be worthy is the opinion that fire cannot melt out of me. I will die in it at the stake. I must ever an obstinate heretic in the despite of beauty. And never could maintain his part but in the force of his will. That a woman conceived me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her most humble thanks. But that I will have a recheat winded in my forehead or hang a bugle on, in an invisible baldric, all women shall pardon me. Because I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any, I will do myself the right to trust none. And the fine is, for the which I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. I shall see thee, ere I die, look pale with love. Oh, with anger, with sickness, or with hunger, my lord, not with love. Prove that ever I lose more blood with love than I will get again with drinking, Pick out mine eyes with the ballad maker's pen and hang me up at the door of the brothel house for the sign of blind Cupid. Well, if ever thou dost fall from this faith, thou wilt prove a notable argument. If I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat and shoot at me. And he that hits me, let him be clapped on the shoulder and called Adam. Well, as time shall try, in the time the savage bull doth bear the yoke. The savage bull may, but if ever the sensible Benedict bear it, pluck off the bull's horns and set them in my forehead, and let me be vilely painted, and in such great letters as they write, here is good horse to hire, let, they, let them signify under my sign, here you may see Benedict, the married man. If this should ever happen, thou wouldst be horn mad. Nay, if Cupid have not spent all his quiver in Venice, thou wilt quake for this shortly. I look for an earthquake, too, then. Well, you temporize with the hours. In the meantime, good Signor Benedict, repair to Leonardo's. Commend me to him and tell him I will not fail him at supper. For indeed, he hath made great preparation. I have almost matter enough in me for such an embassage. And so I commit you... To the tuition of God from my house, if I had it. The 6th of July, your loving friend... <laughs> Nay, mock not, mock not. The body of your discourse is sometimes guarded with fragments, and the guards are but slightly basted on, neither. Ere you flout old ends any further, examine your conscience. And so I leave you. My liege, your highness may now do me good. <laughs> My love is thine to teach. Teach it but how, and thou shalt see how apt it is to learn any hard lesson that may do thee good. Hath Leonardo any son, my lord? Mm, no child but hero. She is his only heir. Dost thou affect her, Claudio? Oh, my lord, when you went onward in this ended action, I looked upon her with a soldier's eye that liked, but had a rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. But now I am returned, and that war thoughts have left their places vacant, in their rooms come thronging soft and delicate desires, all prompting me how fair young hero is, saying, I liked her ere I went to wars. And thou wilt be like a lover presently, and tire the hearer of a book of words. If thou dost love fair hero, cherish it. I will break with her and with her father, and thou shalt have her. Was it not to this end that thou beganest to twist so fine a story? 
How sweetly you do minister to love that knows love's grief by his complexion. But lest my liking prove too sudden, I would have salved it with a longer treatise. Uh, what need the bridge much broader than the flood? <laughs> the fairest grant is the necessity. Look, what will serve is fit. It is once thou lovest, and I will fit thee with the remedy. I know we shall have a reveling tonight. I will assume thy part in some disguise and tell fair hero that I am Claudia. And in her bosom I'll unclasp my heart and take her hearing prisoner with the force and strong encounter of my amorous tale. Then after to her father will I break and the conclusion is she shall be thine. In practice, let us put it presently. Scene two, a room in Leonato's house. How now, brother? Where is my cousin, your son? Hath he provided the music? He is very busy about it. But brother, I can tell you strange news that you yet dreamt not of. Are they good? As the event stamps them, but they have a good cover. They show well outward. The prince and Count Claudio walking in a thick pleached alley in mine orchard were thus much overheard by a man of mine. The prince discovered to Claudio that he loved my niece, your daughter, and meant to acknowledge it this night in a dance. And if he found her accordant, he meant to take the present time by the top and instantly break with you of it. Hath the fellow any wit that told you this? A good sharp fellow. I will send for him and question him yourself. No, no. We will hold it as a dream till it appear itself. But I will acquaint my daughter with all, that she may be the better prepared for an answer, if her adventure this be true. Go you and tell her of it. What the good you, my lord? Why are you thus out of measure sad? Oh, there is no measure in the occasion that breeds, therefore the sadness is without limit. You should hear reason. Oh, and when I have heard it, what blessings brings it? If not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. I wonder that thou, being as thou sayest thou art born under Saturn, goest about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am, I must be, sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jests, eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure, sleep when I am drowsy and tend to no man's business, laugh when I am merry and claw no man in his humor. Yeah, but you must not make the full show of this till you may do it without controlment. You have of late stood out against your brother and he hath ta'en you newly into his grace where it is impossible you should take true root, but by the fair weather that you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the, re frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though, I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man. It must not be denied, but I am a plain-dealing villain. I am trusted with a muzzle and enfranchised with a clog. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? Oh, I make all use of it, for I use it only. Uh, who comes here? Ah, what news, Baracchio? I came yonder from a great supper. The prince, your brother, is royally entertained by Leonardo, and I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Ooh, will it serve for any model to build mischief on? Oh, oh what is he for a fool? Oh, sorry. Boop, boop. For a fool that betrothes himself to unquietness. Marry, it is your brother's right hand. Ooh, the most exquisite Claudio. Oh, even he. Ah, proper squire. And who, and who, which way looks he? Marry, on Hero, the daughter and heir of Leonato. A very forward march, chick. How came you to this? 
being entertained for a perfumer as I was smoking a musty room, comes me the prince and Claudio, hand in hand in sad conference. I whipped me behind the arras and there heard it agreed upon that the prince should woo Hero for himself and having obtained her, give her to Count Claudio. <laughs> uh, come, come, let us thither. This may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him anyway, I bless myself every way. You are both sure and will assist me? To the death, my lord. Well, let us to the great supper. Their cheer is the greater that I am subdued. Would the cook were of my mind? Shall we go prove what's to be done? We'll wait upon your lordship. Act two, scene one, a hall in Leonata's house. Was not Count John here at supper? I saw him not. How tartly that gentleman looks. I never can see him, but I am heartburned an hour after. He is of a very melancholy disposition. He were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between him and Benedict. The one is too like an image and says nothing, and the other, like my lady's eldest son, ever more tattling. Then half Signor Benedict's tongue in Count John's mouth, and half Count John's melancholy in Signor Benedict's face. <laughs> With a good leg and a good foot, uncle, and money enough in his purse, such a man would win any woman in the world, if I could get her goodwill. Oh, by my troth, niece, thou wilt never get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. <laughs> In faith, she's too cursed. Too cursed is more than cursed. I shall lessen God's sending that way, for it is said, God sends a cursed cow short horns. But to a cow too cursed, he sends none. Huh. So by being too cursed, God will send you no horns. Just, if he send me no husband, for the which blessing I am at him upon my knees every morning and evening. Lord, I could not endure husband with a beard on his face. I'd rather lie in the woolen. You may light on a husband that hath no beard. What should I do with it? Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? He that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me. And he that is less than a man, I am not for him. Therefore, I will even take sixpence in earnest of the beer ward and lead his apes into hell. Well then, go you into hell? No, but to the gate. And there will the devil meet me like an old cuckold with horns on his head and say, get you to heaven, Beatrice, get you to heaven. Here's no place for, your, for you maids. So deliver I up my apes and away to St. Peter for the heavens. He shows me where the bachelors sit and there live we as merry as the day is long. <laughs> <laughs> well, niece, I trust you will be ruled by your father. Yes, faith. It is my cousin's duty to make curtsy and say, father, as it please you. But yet for all that, cousin, let him be a handsome fellow, or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as it please me. Well, niece, I hope to see you one day fitted with a husband. Not till God make men of some other metal than earth. Would it not grieve a woman to be overmastered with a piece of valiant dust? To make an account of her life to a clod of wayward man? No, uncle, I'll none. Adam's sons are my brethren, and truly, I hold it a sin to match in my kindred. A daughter, remember what I told you. If the prince do solicit you in that kind, you know your answer. The fault will be in the music, cousin. If you be not wooed in good time, if the prince be too important, tell him there is measure in everything and so dance out the answer. For hear me, hero, Wooing, wedding, and repenting is as a scotch jig, a measure, a sink a pace. The first suit is hot and hasty like a scotch jig and full as fantastical. The wedding, mannerly modest as a measure, full of state and, and scientry, and then comes repentance and with his bad legs falls into the sink a pace faster and faster till he sink into his grave. Cousin, 
You apprehend passing shrewdly. I have a good eye, uncle. I can see a church by daylight. Oh, the revelers are entering. Brother, make good room. Nin, will you walk about with your friend? So you walk softly and look sweetly and say nothing. I'm yours for the walk, and especially when I walk away. With me in your company? I may say so, when I please. And when please you to say so? <laughs> when I like your favor, for God defend the woman be like the case. <laughs> My visor is Philemon's roof, within the house's jaw. <laughs> Why then, your visor should be thatched. <laughs> speak low if you speak love. Yeah, I would. You did like me. So would not I, for your own sake, for I have many ill qualities. <laughs> Which is one. I say my prayers aloud. Oh, I love you the better. The hearers may cry, amen. God match me with a good dancer. Amen. And God keep him out of my sight when the dance is done. Answer, clerk. <laughs> no more words. The clerk is answered. I know you well enough. You are Signor Antonio. <laughs> At a word, I'm not. I know you by the waggling of your head. To tell you true, I you counterfeit him. You could never do him so ill will unless you were the very man. Here's his dry hand up and down. You are he, you are he. That's a word I am not. Come, come. Do you think I do not know you by your excellent wit? Can virtue hide itself? Go to, mum, you are he. Graces will appear and there's an end. <laughs> will you not tell me who told you so? No, you shall pardon me. Nor will you not tell me who you are. Not now. That I was disdainful and that I had my good wit out of the hundred mercy takes. Well, this was Signor, Signor Benedict that said so. What's he? I am sure you know him well enough. Not I, believe me. Did he never make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Why? He's the prince's jester, a very dull fool. Only his gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy. For he both pleases men and angers them, and then they laugh at him and beat him. I'm sure he is in the fleet. I would he had boarded me. When I know the gentleman, I'll tell him what you say. Do, do! He'll but break a comparison or two on me, which peradventure not marked or not laughed at, strikes him into melancholy. And then there's a partridge wink saved, for the fool will eat no supper that night. We must follow the leaders. In every good thing. Nay, if they lead to any ill, I will leave them at the next turning. Sure my brother is amorous on Hero, and hath withdrawn her father to break with him about it. The ladies follow her, and but one visor remains. And that, and that is Claudio. I know him by his bearing. Are you not uh, Signor Benedict? You know me well. I am he. Ah, uh, Signor, you are very near my brother in his love. He is enamored on Hero. I pray you, dissuade him from her. She is no equal for his birth. You may do the part of an honest man in it. How, uh, how know you he loves her? I heard him swear his affection. So did I too, and he swore he would marry her tonight. Uh, come, let us to the banquet. Thus answer I in the name of Benedict, but hear these ill news with the ears of Claudio. Tis certain so, the prince woos for himself. Friendship is constant in all other things, save the office and affairs of love. Therefore all hearts in love use their own tongues. Let every eye negotiate for itself and trust no agent, for beauty is a witch against whose charms faith melteth into blood. This is an accident of hourly proof which I mistrusted not. Farewell, therefore, hero. 
Count Claudio. Yea, the same. Come, will you go with me? Whither? Even to the next willow, about your own business, county. What fashion will you wear the garland of? About your neck, like an usurer's chain, or under your arm, like a lieutenant's scarf? You must wear it one way, for the prince hath got your hero. I wish him joy of her. Why, that's spoken like an honest rovier. So they sell bollocks. But did you think the prince would have served you thus? I pray you leave me. Oh, now you strike like the blind man. T'was the boy that stole your meat, and you'll beat the post. If it will not be, I'll leave you. <sighs> Alas, poor hurt fowl. Now will he creep into the sedges. But that my lady Beatrice should know me and not know me. The prince's fool. <laughs> it may be I go under that title because I am merry. Yea, but so I am apt to do myself wrong. I am not so reputed. It is the base, though bitter disposition of Beatrice that puts the world into her person and so gives me out. Well, I'll be a re revenged as I may. Now, Signor, where's the Count? Did you see him? Troth, my lord, I have played the part of Lady Fame. I found him here as melancholy as a lodge in a warren. I told him, and I think I told him true, that your grace had got the good will of this young lady. And I offered him my company to a willow tree, either to make him a garland as being forsaken, or to bind him up a rod as being worthy to be whipped. You whipped? Well, what's his fault? The flat transgression of a schoolboy who, being overjoined with finding a bird's nest, shows it his companion, and he steals it. Who thought make it just a transgression? The transgression is in the stealing. Yet it had not been amiss. The rod had been made, and the garland too, for the garland he might have worn himself, and the rod he might have bestowed on you, who, as I take it, have stolen his bird's nest. Oh, I will but teach them to sing and restore them to the owner. If their singing answer your saying, by my faith you say honestly. Lady Beatrice. A quarrel with you. The gentleman that danced to her told her she is much wronged by you. Oh, she misused me past the endurance of a block. An oak with but one green leaf on it would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. She told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was the princess jester, that I was duller than a great thaw cuddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark with a whole army shooting at me. She speaks poniards, and every word stabs. If her breath were as, <laughs> as terrible as her terminations, there were no living near her. She would infect to the North Star. <sighs> I would not marry her, though she were endowed with all that Adam had left him before he transgressed. She would have made Hercules have turned spit, yea, and have cleft his club to make the fire, too. Come, talk not of her. You shall find her the infernal eighty in good apparel. I would to God some scholar would conjure her, for certainly while she is here, a man may live as quiet in hell as in a sanctuary. And people sin upon purpose, because they would rather go thither. So, indeed, all this quiet, horror, and perturbation follows her. <laughs> and look, here she comes. Oh, will your grace command me any service to the world's end? I will go to the slightest, on the slightest errand now to the antipodes that you can devise to send me on. I will fetch you a toothpicker now from the furthest inch of Asia, bring you the length of Prester John's foot, fetch you a hair off the great Sham's beard, do you any embassage to the pygmies, rather than hold three words conference with this harpy. Have you no employment for me? Um, but to desire your good company. Oh, God. Sir, here's a dish I love not. I cannot endure my lady tongue. Come, lady. <laughs> Come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. 
Indeed, my lord. He lented me a while and I gave him use for it. A double heart for his single one. Mary, once before he won it for me with false dice, therefore your grace may well say I have lost it. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. So I would not he should do me, my lord, lest I should prove the mother of fools? I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. Why, how now, Count? Therefore aren't you sad? Not sad, my lord. How then? Sick? Neither, my lord. The Count is neither sad nor sick, nor merry nor well, but civil Count, civil as an orange, and something of that jealous complexion. Faith, lady, I think you're blazoned to be true. Though, I'll be sworn if he be so, his conceit is false. Here, Claudio, I have wooed in thy name, and fair hero is won. I have broke with her father, and his good will obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count, take of me my daughter, and with her my fortunes. His grace has made the match, and all grace say amen to it. Speak, Count, tis your cue. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I were but little happy if I could say how much. Lady, as I am yours, I give away myself for you and dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss. And let not him speak neither. <laughs> Faith, lady, you have a merry heart. Yea, my lord, I thank it, poor fool. It keeps on the windy side of care. My cousin tells him in his ear that he is in her heart. And so she doth, cousin. Good lord for alliance. Thus goes every one to the world but I, and I am sunburnt. I may sit in a corner and cry hi-ho for a husband. <laughs> Lady Beatrice, I will get you one. I would rather have one of your father's getting. Hath your grace ne'er a brother like you? Your father got excellent husbands, if a maid could come by them. Will you have me, Lady? <coughs> <coughs> um, no, my lord, unless... I might have another for working days. Your grace is too costly to wear every day. But I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. Oh, it, your, your silence offends me. Um, and to be merry best becomes you. For out of question, you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord. Uh, my mother cried, but then there was a star dance and under that I was born. Cousins, God give you joy. Niece, will you look to those things I told you of? I cry your mercy, uncle, by your grace's pardon. By my truth, pleasant spirited lady. There is little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. She is never sad but when she sleeps, and not even sad then, for as I have heard my daughter say, she has often dreamed of unhappiness and waked herself with laughing. She cannot endure to hear tell of a husband. Oh, by no means. She mocks all of her wooers out of suit. Mm. She were an excellent wife for Benedict. <laughs> oh, Lord, my Lord. If they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. <laughs> County Claudio. When mean you to go to church? Tomorrow, my lord. Time goes on crutches till love have all his rights. Not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence a just seven night, and a time too brief, too, to have all things answer my mind. Come, you shake your head at so long a breathing, but I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will, in the interim, undertake one of Hercules' labors, which is to bring Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection, the one with the other. I would fain have it a match, and I doubt not but to fashion it, if you three will but minister such assistance as I shall give you direction. 
my lord, I am for you, though it cost me ten nights watching. And I, my lord. And you too, gentle girl. I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. Benedict is not the unhopefulest husband that I know. Thus far can I praise him. He is a noble strain and of approved valor and confirmed honesty. I will teach you how to humor your cousin. She will fall in love with Benedict. And I, with your two helps, will so practice on Benedict that in despite of his quick wit and his queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. His glory shall be ours, for we are the only love gods. Go in with me, and I will tell you my dreams. Scene two, the same. It is so. The Count Claudio shall marry the daughter of Leonardo. Yea, my lord, but I can cross it. Any bar, any cross, any impediment will be medicinable to me. I am sick in displeasure to him. And whatsoever comes athwart his affection ranges evenly with mine. How canst you cross this marriage? Not honestly, my lord, but so covertly that no dishonesty shall appear in me. Show me briefly how. Well, I think I hold, told your lordship a year since how much I am in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to hero. I remember. <laughs> well, I can at, at any seasonable instant of the night appoint her to look out at her lady's chamber window. <laughs> What life is in that to well, be the death of this marriage? Oh, and the poison of that lies in you to temper. Go you to the prince, your brother. Spare not to tell him that he is, that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudio, whose estimation do you mightily hold up to a contaminated stale, such as one as hero. And what proof shall I make of that? Uh, proof enough to misuse the prince, to vex Claudio, to undo Hero, and kill Leonardo. Look you for any other issue? Well, only to despite them, I will endeavor anything. Well, go then. Find me a meet hour to draw Don Pedro and the Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me. Intend a, a kind of zeal, both to the prince and Claudio, as, oh, in love of your brother's honor, who hath made this match and this friend's reputation, who is thus likely to be cousin with the semblance of a maid, <laughs> that you have discovered thus. They will scarcely believe this without trial. But offer them instances, which shall bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hear me call her Margaret Hero. Hear Margaret term me Claudio. <laughs> and bring them to see this the very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent, and there shall appear such seeming truth of Hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance, and all the preparation overthrown. <laughs> Grow this to what adverse issue it can. I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the working of this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. Oh, be you constant in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame me. I will go presently and learn their day of marriage. Scene three, Leonardo's Orchid. Boy? Senor? Ah, in my chamber window lies a book. Bring it hither and to me in the orchard. I am here already. I know that, but I would have thee hence and here again. <laughs> hmm. 
I do much wonder that one man seeking how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. And such a man is Claudio. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife, and now he had rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten mile of foot to see a good armor, and now will he lie ten nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet. He was wont to speak plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier. And now he has torn orthography. His words are a very fantastical bouquet, just so many strange dishes. May I be so converted that and see with the, these eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn, but love may transform me to an oyster. But I'll take my oath on it. Till he have made me an oyster of me, he shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be, that's certain. Wise or all none. Virtuous or I'll never cheapen her. Fair or I'll never look on her. Mild or come not near me. Noble or not I for an angel. Of good discourse, an excellent musician. And her hair shall be of what color God it pleases God. Ha! <laughs> The prince and Monsieur Love, I will hide me on in the arbor. Shall we hear this music? Yea, my good lord, how still the evening is, as hushed on purpose to grace harmony. See you where Benedict hath hid himself. Oh, very well, my lord. The music ended will fit the kid fox with a pennyworth. Come, Balthazar, we'll hear that song again. Oh, my good Lord, tax not so bad a voice to slander music any more than once. It is the witness still of excellency to put a strange face on his own perfection. I pray thee, sing, and let me woo no more. Because you talk of wooing, I will sing. Since many a wooer doth commence his suit to her, he thinks not worthy, yet he woos. Yet will he swear he loves. Now pray thee, come, or if there will hold longer argument, do it in notes. Note this before my notes. There's not a note of mine that's worth the noting. Why, these are very crochets he speaks. Note, notes forsooth and nothing. Ah, now divine air, now is his soul ravished. Is it not strange that sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? Well, a horn for my money when all's done. Sigh no more, lady, sigh no more. None were deceivers ever one foot in sea and one on shore. To one thing constant never, and sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, comforting all your sounds of woe. Into hay, nonny, nonny. By my troth, a good song. And an ill singer, my lord. Oh, no, no, faith, thou singest well enough for a shift. And he had been a dog that should have howled thus, they would have hanged him. Ugh, and I pray God his bad voice bode no mis mischief. I had as Leif had heard the night raven, come what plague could come after it. Hey, Mary, dost thou hear, Balthazar? I pray thee, get us some excellent music, for tomorrow night 
We would have it at the Lady Hero's chamber window. The best I can, my lord. And do so. Farewell. Come hither, Leonato. What was it you told me of today that your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict? Oh, I stuck on, stuck on the falsets. I did never think that lady would have loved any man. No, nor I neither. But most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedict, for whom she hath in all outward behaviors seen ever to abhor. Is it possible? Sits the wind in that corner? I my troth, my lord, I cannot tell but to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection. It is past the infinite of thought. Maybe she doth but counterfeit. Faith, like enough. Oh, God, counterfeit? Oh, there was never counterfeit of passion come so near the delight of passion as she discovers it. Why? What, what effects of passion shows she? Bait the hook well, the fish will bite. What effects, my lord? Uh, she will seek you. You heard my daughter tell you how. She did, indeed. How? How? Maybe you. <sighs> to amaze me, <laughs> I would have, I thought, her spirit had been invincible against all assaults of affection. I would have sworn it had, my lord, especially against Benedict. I should think this a gull, but that the white-bearded fellow speaks it. Knavery cannot sure hide himself in such reverence. He attained the affection. Hold it up. Hath she made her affection known to Benedict? No, and she swears she never will. That's her torment. Tis true indeed, so your daughter says. Shall I, says she, that have so oft encountered him with scorn, write to him that I love him? This says she now, when she is beginning to write to him, for she will be up twenty times a night, and there she will sit in her smock till she have writ a sheet of paper. My daughter tells all. Now that you talk of a sheet of paper, I remember a pretty jest your daughter told us of. Oh, oh when she had writ it, and she was reading it over. She found Benedict and Beatrice between the sheets. <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, as she tore the letter into a thousand halfpence, uh, railed at herself that she should be so immodest to write to one that would succeed that she knew would flout her. I measure him, says she, by my own spirit, for I should flout him if he writ to me. Yea, though I love him, I should. Then down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs, beats her heart, tears her hair, prays, curses. Oh, sweet Benedict, God, give me patience. Oh, she doth indeed. My daughter says so. And the ecstasy has so much overborne her that my daughter is sometimes afeard that she will do a desperate outrage to herself. It is very true. It were good that Benedict knew of it by some other, but she will not discover it. To what end? He would make sport of it and torment the poor lady worse. And he should. It were an alms to hang him. She's an excellent, sweet lady, and out of all suspicion, she is virtuous. And she is exceeding wise. In everything, but in loving Benedict. Oh, my lord, wisdom and blood combating in so tender a body. We have ten proofs to one that blood hath the victory. I am sorry for her, as I have just cause, being her uncle and her guardian. I wish she had bestowed this dotage on me. I would have daffed all other respects and made her half myself. I pray you tell Benedict of it, and hear what he will say. Good, good, thank you. Hero thinks surely she will die, for she says she will die if he love her not, and she will die ere she make her love known, and she will die if he woo her rather than bait one breath of her accustomed crossness. She doth well. If she should make tender of her love, tis very possible he'll scorn it. For the man, as you know all, hath a contemptible spirit. He's a very proper man. And he hath indeed a good 
outward happiness. Before God, and in my mind, very wise. Doth indeed so show some sparks that are uh, like wit. And I take him to be valiant. As Hector, I assure you. And in the managing of quarrels, you may say he is wise, for either he avoids them with great discretion, or undertakes them with a most Christian-like fear. If he do fear God, I must necessarily keep peace. If he break the peace, he ought to enter into a quarrel with fear and trembling. And so will he do. For the man doth fear God, howsoever it seems not in him by some large jests he will make. Well, I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go seek Benedict and tell him of her love? Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. Well, we will hear further of it by your daughter. Let it cool the while. I love Benedict well, and I could wish he would most modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy so good a lady. My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. If he do not dote on her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. <laughs> Let there be the same sp net spread for her, and that must your own daughter and her gentlewoman carry. The sport will be when they hold one an opinion of the other's dotage, and no such matter. That's the scene that I would see, which will be merely a dumb show. Oh, let us send her to call him into dinner. <laughs> this can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? <laughs> Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I'm, I must not seem proud. <clears throat> Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis truth, I can bear them witness. And virtuous, tis so, I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me. By my troth, it is no addition to her wit, nor no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage, but doth the appetite not alter? A man loves the meat in his youth and he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? No. The world must be peopled. And when I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Huh? Oh, here comes Beatrice. By this day, she's a fair lady. I do spar some marks of love in her. Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. Fair Beatrice, thank you for your pains. I took no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me. If, that, if it had been painful, I would not have come. Ah, you take pleasure then in the message. Yea, just so much as you may take upon a knife's point and choke a doll withal. <laughs> have no stomach, senor. Fare you well. <laughs> Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. There's a double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much to say any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not pit take pity on her, I am a villain. If I do not love her, I am a fool. I will go get her picture. Act three, 
Scene one, Leonardo's garden. Good Margaret, run thee to the parlor. There shalt thou find my cousin Beatrice proposing with the prince and Claudio. Whisper in her ear and tell her I and Ursula walk in the orchard and our whole discourse is all of her. See that thou overheardst us and bid her steal into the pleached bower. There will she hide her to listen to our purpose. This is thy office, bear thee well in it and leave us alone. I'll make her come, I warrant you, presently. <laughs> now, Ursula, when Beatrice doth come, as we do trace this alley up and down, our talk must only be of Benedict. When I do name him, let it be thy part to praise him more than ever man did merit. My talk to thee must be how Benedict is sick in love with Beatrice. Of this matter is little Cupid's crafty arrow made that wounds only by hearsay. Now begin. <laughs> For look where Beatrice, like a lapwing, runs close by the ground to hear our conference. The pleasantest angling is to see the fish cut with her golden oars the silver stream and greedily devour the treacherous bait. So angle we for Beatrice, who even now is couched in the woodbine couverture. Hear ye not my part of the dialogue. When we go near her, that her ear lose nothing of the false sweet bait that we lay for her. No, truly, Ursula, she is too disdainful. I know her spirits are as coy and wild as haggards of the rock. But are you sure that Benedict loves Beatrice so entirely? So says the prince and my new troth to lord. And did they bid you tell her of it, madam? They did entreat me to acquaint her of it, but I persuaded them, if they loved Benedict, to wish him wrestle with affection and never let Beatrice know of it. Why did you, why did you so? Doth not the gentleman deserve as full as fortunate a bed as ever Beatrice shall couch upon? Oh, God of love, I know he doth deserve as much as may be yielded to a man, but nature never framed a woman's heart of prouder stuff than that of Beatrice. Disdain and scorn ride sparkling in her eyes, misprising what they look on, and her wit values itself so highly that to her all matter else seems weak. She cannot love, nor take no shape, nor pro project of affection. She is so self-endeared. Sure, I think so. And therefore, certainly it were not good she knew his love, lest she make sport of it. <laughs> you speak truth. I never yet saw man how wise, how noble, young, how rarely featured, but she would spell him backward. If fair-faced, she would swear the gentleman should be her sister. If tall, a lance ill-headed. If low, an agate very vilely cut. If speaking, why a vein blown with all winds. If silent, why a block moved with none. So turns she every man the wrong side out and never gives to truth and virtue that which simpleness and merit purchaseth. Sure, sure, such carping is not commendable. No, not to be so odd and from all fashions as Beatrice is, cannot be commendable. But who dare tell her so? If I should speak, she would mock me into air, or she would laugh at me out of myself, press me to death with wit. Therefore, let Benedict, like covered fire, consume away in sighs, waste inwardly. It would were a better death to die with mocks, which is as bad as dying with tickling. Yet yeah, tell her of it. Hear what she will say. No. <laughs> Rather, I will go to Benedict and counsel him to fight against his passion. And truly, I'll devise some honest slanders to stain my cousin with. One does not know how much an ill word may empoison liking. Oh, do not do your cousin such a wrong. She <laughs> cannot be so much without true judgment, having so swift and excellent a wit, uh, as she is prized to have us to refuse so rare a gentleman as Signor Benedict. He is the only man of Italy. Always accepted, my dear Claudio. I pray you, be not angry with me, madam. Speaking my fancy, Signor Benedict, for shape, for bearing, argument, and valor, goes foremost in report through Italy. Indeed, he hath an excellent good name. His excellence did earn it, ere he had it. What are you married, madam? Oh, why, every day, tomorrow. 
come, go in. I'll show thee some attires and have thy counsel, which is best to furnish me tomorrow. She's limed, I warrant you. We have <laughs> caught her, madam. If it proves so, then loving goes by haps. Some cupids kill with arrows, some with traps. <laughs> what fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt, farewell, and maiden pride, adieu. No, glory lives behind the back of such. And Benedict, love on, I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it is better than reportingly. Scene two, a room in Leonardo's house. I do but stay till your marriage be consummate, and then I go toward Aragon. I'll bring you thither, my lord, if you vouchsafe me. Nay, <laughs> that would be as great a soil, and the new gloss of your marriage is to, to show a child his new coat and forbid him to wear it. I will only be bold with Benedict for his company, for from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, he is all mirth. He hath twice or thrice cut Cupid's bowstring, and the little hangman dare not shoot at him. He hath a heart as sound as a bell, and his tongue is the clapper. For what his heart thinks, his tongue speaks. Gallants, I am not as I have been. So say I. Methinks you are sadder. I hope he is in love. Oh, I am truant. There's no too true drop of blood in him to be touched with love. If he be sad, he wants money. I have the toothache. Draw it. Hang it. You must hang it first and draw it afterwards. What? <sighs> Sigh for the toothache? Where is but a humor or a worm? Well, every one can master a grief, but he that has it. Yet say I, he is in love. There is no appearance of fancy in him, unless it be a fancy that he hath to strange disguises, as to, to be a Dutchman today, Frenchman tomorrow, or, or in the shape of two countries at once, as a, a German from the waist downwards, or slops, and a Spaniard from the waist upward, no doublet. Unless he have a fancy to this foolery, as it appears he hath, he has no fool for fancy, as you would have it appear he is. If he be not in love with some woman, there is no believing old signs. He brushes his hat on mornings. What should that bode? Hath any man seen him at the barber's? No, but the barber's man hath been seen with him, and the old adornment of his cheek hath already stuffed tennis balls. Indeed, he looks younger than he did by the loss of a beard. Nay, he rubs himself with civet. Can you smell him out by that? That's as much to say the sweet youth's in love. The greatest note of it is his melancholy. And when was he wont to wash his face? Nay, or to paint himself, for the which I hear what they say of him. Nay, but his jesting spirit, which has now crept into lute string, is governed by stops. Indeed, it tells a heavy tale for him. Conclude, conclude, he is in love. Nay, but I know who loves him. That what I know too, I warrant, one that knows him not. Yes, and his ill conditions, and, despite of all of that, dies for him. Uh, she shall be buried with her face upward. Yet is this no charm for the toothache? Old Signor, walk aside with me. I have studied eight or nine wise words to speak to you, which these hobby horses must not hear. For my life to break with him about Beatrice. It is even so. Hero and Margaret have played their parts with Beatrice, and then the two bears will not bite another when they meet. My lord and brother, God save you. Good then, brother. Uh, if your leisure served, I would speak with you. In private? If it please you, yet Count Claudio may hear, for what I would speak of concerns him. 
What's the matter? Means your lordship to be married tomorrow. You know he does. I know not that when he knows what I know. If there be any impediment, I pray you discover it. You may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter, and aim better at me by that I now will manifest. For my brother, I think he holds you well, and in dearness of heart hath hope to affect your ensuing marriage. Surely suit ill spent and labor ill bestowed. Why? What's the matter? I came hither to tell you, and circumstances shortened, for she has been too long a talking of the lady is disloyal. Ooh, hero? Even she, Leonardo's hero, your hero, every man's hero. Disloyal? The word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse. Think you of a worse title and I will fit it to her. Wonder not till further warrant. Uh, go but with me tonight. You shall see her chamber window entered, even the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow wed her, but it would better fit your honor to change your mind. May this be so? I will not think it. If you dare not trust that you see, confess not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight why I should not marry her tomorrow in the congregation where I should wed, there will I shame her. And as I have wooed thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no farther till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly, but till midnight, and let the issue show itself. Day untowardly turned. Oh, mischief strangely thwarting. Oh, plague right well prevented. So will you say when you have seen the sequel. Scene three, a street. Are you good men and true? Ye, or else it were pity they should suffer salvation, body and soul. Nay, there were a punishment too good for them. If they should have any allegiance in them, bring them chosen for the prince's watch. Well, give them their charge, neighbor Dogberry. First, who think you the most deserveless man to be the constable? Hugh Oatcake, sir, or George Seacole, for they can write and read. Come hither, neighbor Seacole. God hath blessed you with a good name. To be well-favored man is a gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. False which, Master Constable? You have, I knew it would be your answer. Well, for your favor, sir, why give God thanks and make no boast of it? And for your writing or reading, let that appear that there is no need of such vanity. You are thought here to be the most senseless and fit man for the Constable of the Watch. Therefore, bear you the lantern. This is your charge. You shall comprehend all vagrant men. You are to bid any man stand in the prince's name. How? If I will not stand. Why then take no note of him, but let him go and presently call the rest of the watch together, and thank God you are rid of an ave. If he will not stand where he is bidden, he is none of the prince's subjects. True, and they are to meddle with none but the prince's subjects. You shall also make no noise in the streets, for the watch to babble and to talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. We would rather sleep than talk. We know not, we know what belongs to a watch. Why, you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only have a care that your bills not be stolen. Well, you are to call at the alehouses and bid those that are drunk get them out to bed. How, if they will not? Why, then let them alone till they are sober. If they make you not the better answer, you may say that they are not the men you took them for. Well, sir. If you made a thief, you may suspect him by virtue of your office. To be no true man, for such kind men, the less you meddle or make with them, why the more is for your honesty. If we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? <sighs> Truly by your office you may, but I think that touch pitch will be defiled. The most peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself what is he and steal out of your company? You have always been, you have been always called a merciful man, partner. Truly, I would not hang a dog by my will, much more a man who hath any honesty in him. 
If you hear a child cry in the night, you must call to the nurse and bid her still it. How? If the nurse be asleep and will not hear us? Why then depart in peace and let the child wake her with crying? For the ooh that will not hear her lamb when it bays will never answer a calf when he bleats. Tis very true. Tis the end of the charge, you constable, are to present the prince his own person. If you meet the prince in the night, you may stay him. Nay, by our lady, that I think I cannot. Five shillings to one off to when any man knows the statues. He may stay him, marry not without the prince be willing. For indeed the watch ought to offend no man, and it is an offense to stay a man against his will. By a lady, I think it be so. <laughs> well, masters, good night. And there be any matter of wake chances, call me up, keep your fellow's counsel on your own, and good night. Come, neighbor. Well, masters, we hear our charge. Let us go sit here upon the church bench till two, and then all to bed. One more word, honest neighbors. I pray you watch about Signor Leonardo's door for the wedding being there tomorrow. There is a great coil tonight. I do. Be vigilant. I beseech you. What, Conrad? Peace. Stir not. Uh, Conrad, I say. Here, man, I'm at thy elbow. A oh, mass, and my elbow itched. I thought there would be a scab follow. I will owe thee an answer for that, and I'll forward with thy tail. Uh, stand thee close, then, then under this penthouse, for it drizzles rain, and I will, like a true drunkard, utter all to thee. Some treason, masters, yet stand close. Oh, therefore, no, I have earned of John John a thousand ducats. <laughs> Is it possible that any villainy should be so dear? Well, I should rather ask if it were possible any villainy should be so rich. <laughs> For when rich villains have need of poor ones, oh, poor ones may make what price they will. I wonder at it. Oh, that shows thou art yeah. unconfirmed. Thou knowest the fashion of a doublet or a hat or a cloak is nothing to a man. Yes, it is apparel. Well, I, I mean, the fashion. Uh, yes, the fashion is the fashion. Uh, but Tosh, I may as well say the, the fool's the fool. <laughs> but seest thou not what a deformed thief this fashion is? I know that deformed. He's been a vile thief this seven year. I'll goes up and down like a gentleman. I remember his name. I, did that thou hear somebody? No, twas the van of the house. Uh, this, uh, seest thou not, I, I say, what a deformed thief this fashion is. Uh, how giddy it turns about all the hot bloods between 14 and 5 and 30. Sometimes <laughs> fashioning them like Pharaoh's soldiers in the reeky painting. Well, sometimes like God Bell's priests in the old church window. Hey, sometimes, like the shaven Hercules in the smirched, warm-eaten tapestry, uh, where his codpiece seems as massy as his club. All this I see. Huh? Fashion I... wears up more peril than the man. But art not thou thyself giddy with the fashion, too, that thou hast shifted out of thy tail and to tell it thee of the fashion? Uh, but not, not so, neither. But, but no... I have tonight wooed Margaret, the lady's hero's gentleman by the name of Hero. She leans me out of the mester's chamber window, bids me a thousand times good night. I, I, I tell this tale vilely. I, I should first tell thee how the, the prince Claudio and my master planted and placed and possessed by my master Don John, saw afar uh, off in the orchard this amiable encounter.
Uh, well, and, and they thought Margaret was hero. Well, two of them did. Uh, the prince and Claudio. <laughs> but the devil, my master, knew she was Margaret. And partly by his oath, which first possessed them, partly by the dark night, which, which did deceive them, but chiefly by my villainy, <laughs> which did confirm any slander that Don John had made, away went Claudio engaged. Oh, swore he would meet her as he was appointed next morning at the temple, and there, before the whole congregation, shame her with what he saw all night, and send her home again without a husband. We charge you, in the prince's name, stand. Call up the right master constable. We have here recovered the most dangerous piece of luxury that ever was known in the Commonwealth. And one deformed is one of them. I know him. He wears a lock. Masters, masters. You'll be made bring the for deformed forth. I warrant you. Masters. Name Never is speak. We charge you, let, let us Masters. obey you to go Masters. with us. We are, are like to prove a, a goodly commodity right. being taken oh, up of these men's bills. Wow. A commodity in question, I warrant you. Come, we'll obey you. Scene four, Hero's Apartment. <sighs> Good Ursula, wake my cousin Beatrice and desire her to rise. I will, lady. And bid her come hither. Well. Charles, I think your other rabato were better. <laughs> no, pray thee, good Meg. I'll wear this. By my troth, not so good. And I warrant your cousin will say so. My cousin's a fool, and thou art another. I'll wear none but this. I like the new tire within excellently. If the hair were a thought browner, and your gown's a most rare fashion of faith, I saw the Duchess of Milan, Milan's gown that they praise so. Oh, that exceeds, they say. By my troths, but a nightgown in respect of yours. Cloth of gold and cuts and laced with silver, set with pearls, down sleeves, side sleeves, and skirts round underborne with a bluish tinsel. But for a fine, quaint, graceful, and excellent fashion, yours is worth ten on it. God give me joy to wear it, for my heart is exceeding heavy. Twill be heavier soon by the weight of a man. Uh, fight thee! Art not ashamed? Of what, lady? Of speaking honorably. Is not marriage honorable in a beggar? Is not your lord honorable without marriage? I think you would have me say, saving your reverence a husband. Mm -hmm. And bad thinking do not rest true speaking, I'll offend nobody. Is there any harm in the heavier for a husband? None, I think, and it be the right husband and the right wife. Otherwise, tis light and not heavy. Ask my lady Beatrice else. Here she comes. Good morrow, cuz. Good morrow, sweet hero. <laughs> Why hi now? You speak in sick tune? I'm out of all other tune, methinks. Claps and delight of love. That goes without a burden. Do you sing it and I'll dance it? Ye lie to love with your heels. Then if your husband have stables enough, you'll see he shall lack no barns. Oh, illegitimate construction. I scorn that with my heels. Tis almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you were ready. By my troth, I am exceeding ill. Hi-ho. For a hawk, a horse, or a husband? For the letter that begins them all. H. Well, and you be not turned Turk, there's no more sailing by the star. What means the fool trow? Oh, nothing I, but God send everyone their heart's desire. <clears throat> These gloves the Count sent me, they are an excellent perfume. I am stuffed, cousin, I cannot smell. A maid and stuffed? There's goodly catching of cold. Oh, God help me. <laughs> God help me. How long have you professed apprehension? Ever since you left it, doth not my wit become me rarely? It does not seem enough. You should wear it in your cap. By my troth, I am sick. Get you some of this distilled carduous benedictus and lay it to your heart. It is the only thing for a qualm. 
Or thou prickest her with a thistle. <laughs> Benedictus? Why Benedictus? You have some moral in this Benedictus? Moral? No, by my troth. I have no moral meaning. I meant plain holy thistle. You may think, perchance, that I think you are in love. Nay, by our lady, I am not such a fool to think what I list, nor I list not to think what I can, nor indeed I cannot think, if I would think my heart out of thinking, that you are in love, or that you will be in love, or that you can be in love. Yep. Yet, Benedict was such another, and now is he become a man. He swore he would never marry, and yet now, in despite of his heart, he eats his meat without grudging. And how you may be converted, I know not. But methinks you look with your eyes as other women do. What pace is that the that thy tongue keeps? Not a false gallop. <laughs> Madam withdraw the prince, the count, Signor Benedict, Don John, and all the gallants of the town will come to fetch you to church. Have to dress me, good cuz, good Meg, good Ursula. Scene five, another room in Leonardo's house. What would you with me, honest neighbor? Marry, sir, I would have some confidence with you that discerns you nearly. Brief, I pray you, for you see it is a very busy time with me. Marry, this it is, sir. Yes, in truth it is, sir. What is it, my good friends? Good man, Burgess, sir, speaks a little off the matter. An old man, sir, and his wits are not so blunt as, God help, I would desire they were. But in faith, honest is the skin between his brows. Yes, I thank God I am as honest as any man living that is an old man and no honester than I. Comparisons are odorous, palabras, neighbor Virgis. Neighbors, you are tedious. If it pleases your worship to say so, but we are the part of the Duke's officers. But truly for my own part, if I were as tedious as a king, I could find it in my heart to bestow it all of your worship. All thy tediousness on me, eh? Yea, and twere a thousand pounds more than tis, for I hear a good explanation on your worship, as if any man in the city, and though I be a being a poor man, I am glad to hear it. And so am I. I would fain know what you have to say. Mary, sir, our watch tonight, excepting your worship's pleasant presence, pay ten a couple of as errant knaves as any in Messina. A good old man, sir, he will be talking. As they say, when the age is in, the wit is out. <laughs> God help us. It is a world to see. Well said, ill faith neighbor Virgis. Well, God's a good man. And two men ride of a horse. One must ride behind. <laughs> and on his soul, ill faith, sir, by my troth he is, as ever broke bread. But God is to be worshipped. All men are not alike, alas, good neighbor. Indeed, neighbor, he comes too short of you. Gifts that God gives. I must leave you. One word, sir. Our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons, and we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Take their examination yourself and bring it to me. I am now in great haste, as it may appear unto you. It shall be suffigence. Drink some wine ere you go. Fare you well. My lord, they stay for you to give your daughter to her, your husband, to her husband. I'll wait upon them. I am ready. Go, good partner, go get you to Francis Seacole. Bid him bring his pen and inkhorn to the jail. We are now to examination these men. And we must do it wisely. We will spare for no wit, I warrant you. Here that shall drive some of them to non-come, only get the learned writer to set down our communication and meet me at the jail. One, a church. Act four, scene one, a church. Come, Friar Francis, be brief only to the plain form of marriage, and you shall recount their particular duties afterwards. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady. No. <laughs> to be married to her, Friar, you come to marry her. <laughs> Lady, you come hither to be married to this count. I do. If either of you know any inward impediments why you should be not be conjoined, charge you on your souls to utter it. Do you know any, hero? <laughs> None, my lord. 
no you any counts? I dare make his answer, none. <laughs> oh, what men dare do, what men may do, and what men daily do, not knowing what they do. How now, I interjections? Why then, some be of laughing as, ah, ha, ah, he. Stand thee by, friar. Father, by your leave, will you with free and unconstrained soul give me this maid, your daughter? As freely, son, as God did give her me. And what have I to give you back, whose worth may counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble thankfulness. Therefore, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She is but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cunning sin cover itself with all? Comes not that blood as modest evidence to witness simple virtue? Would you not swear, all you that see her here, that she were a maid by these exterior shows? But she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married, not to knit my soul to an approved wanton. Dear my lord, if you, in your own proof, have vanquished the resistance of her youth and made the feet of her virginity... I know what you would say. If I have known her, you would say she did embrace me as a husband and so extenuate the forehand sin. No, Leonardo. I never tempted her with word too large, but as a brother to a sister showed bashful sincerity and comely love. Seemed I ever otherwise to you? Out on these seeming! I will write against it. You seem to me as Diane in her orb, as chaste as the blood ere it, ere it be blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus or those pampered animals that rage in savage sensuality. Is my lord well that he doth speak so wide? Sweet prince, why speak not you? Should I speak? I stand dishonored that you have gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. Are these things spoken, or do I but dream? Sir, they are spoken, and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. True, oh God! Leonardo, stand I here? Is this the prince? Is this the prince's brother? Is this face, heroes, or are our eyes our own? Oh, this is so. But what of this, my lord? Let me but move one question to your daughter, and by that fatherly and kindly power that you have in her, bid her answer truly. I charge thee do so, as thou art my child. Oh, God defend me, how I am beset! What kind of catechizing you call this? To make you answer truly to your name. Is it not Hero? Who can blot that name with any just reproach? Mary, that can Hero. Hero itself can blot out Hero's virtue. What man was he that talked with you yesternight out your window betwixt twelve and one? Now, if you are a maid, answer to this. I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Why, then you are no maiden. Leonardo, I am sorry you must hear. Upon my honor, myself, my brother, and this grieved count did see her, hear her, at that hour, last night. Talk with a ruffian at her chamber window, who hath indeed most like a liberal villain confessed the vile encounters that they have had a thousand times in secret. Oh, fie, fie, they are not to be named, my lord, not to be spoke of. There is not chastity enough in language without offense to utter them. Thus, pretty lady, I am sorry for thy much misgovernment. Oh, hero, what a hero hadst thou been if half thy outward graces had been placed about thy thoughts and counsels of thy heart. But fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, thou pure impiety and pious purity. For thee I'll lock up the gates of love, and on my eyelids shall conjecture hang, to turn all beauty into thoughts of harm, and never shall it be more gracious. Hast thou, man, dagger here a point for me? Why, how now, cousin? Wherefore sink you down? Oh, come, let us go. These things come thus to light, smother her spirits up. How doth the lady? Dead, I think. Help, uncle. Hero! Why, hero! 
Uncle, Senor Benedict, Friar! Oh, fate, take not away thy heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be wished for. Oh no, cousin Hero. Have comfort, lady. Dost thou look up? Ye, wherefore should she not? Wherefore? Why, doth not every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Could she here deny that the story that is printed in her blood? Do not live, hero. Do not ope thine eyes. For did I think thou wouldst not quickly die, thought I thy spirits were stronger than thy shames? Myself would on the rearward of reproaches strike at thy life. Who oh, grieved I had but one. Why ever wast thou lovely in my eyes? Why had I not with charitable hand took up a beggar's issue at my gates? Who oh, smirchest not admired with infamy? I might have said, no part of it is mine. That shame derives itself from unknown loins. But mine, and mine I loved, and mine I praised, and mine that I was proud on, mine so much that I myself was to myself not mine. Valuing of her, why oh, she, oh, she is fallen into, into a pit of ink that the wide sea hath dropped too few to wash her clean again. Oh, who to insult too little, which may season give to her foul-tainted flesh! Sir, sir, be patient. For my part, I am so attired in wonder, I know not what to say. Oh, on my soul, my cousin is belied. Lady, were you her bedfellow last night? No, truly not. Although until last night, I have this twelve month been her bedfellow. Confirmed! Oh, confirmed! Oh, oh, that is stronger made, which was before barred up with ribs of iron. Would the two princes lie? And Claudio lie, who loved her so that speaking of her foulness, washed it with tears? Oh, hence from her, let her die! Hear me a little. For I have only been silent so long and given way unto this course of fortune. By noting of the lady, I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start into her face. A thousand innocent shames and angel whiteness beat away those blushes. And in her eye there hath appeared a fire to burn the errors that these princes hold against her maiden truth. Call me a fool. Trust not my reading nor my observations, which with experimental seal doth warrant the tenor of my book. Trust not my age, my reverence, calling, nor divinity. If this sweet lady lie not guiltless here, under some biting error. Fire, it cannot be. Thou seest that all the grace that she hath left is that she will not add to her damnation. A sin of perjury, she does not, she, she not denies it. Why seekest thou then to cover with excuse, which a that which appears in proper nakedness. Lady, what man is he you are accused of? They know that do accuse me. I know none. If I know more of any man alive than that which made in modesty doth warrant, let all my sins lack mercy. Oh, my father, prove you that any man with me converse at hours unmeet, or that I yesternight maintained the change of words with any creature, refuse me, hate me, torture me to death. There is some strange misprision in the princes. Two of them have the very bent of honor, and if their wisdoms be misled in this, the practice of it lives in John the Bastard, whose spirits toil in frame of villainies. I know not. If they speak but truth of her, these hands shall tear her. If they wrong her honor, the proudest of them shall well hear of it. Time hath not yet so dried this blood of mine, nor age so eat up my invention, nor fortune made such havoc of my means, nor my bad life reft me so much of friends. But they shall find, awakened in such a kind, both strength of limb and policy of mind, ability and means and choice of friends, 
to quit me of them thoroughly. Pause a while, and let my counsel sway you in this case. Your daughter here, the prince is left for dead. Let her while be secretly kept in, and publish it, that she is dead indeed. Maintain a mourn mourning assertion, and on your family's old monument, hang mournful epitaphs and do all rights that it pertain unto a burial. What shall become of this? What will this do? Mary, this well-carried shall on her behalf. Change slander to remorse, that is some good, but not for that dream I on this strange course, but on this travail look for a greater birth. She dying, as it must so be maintained, upon the instant that she was accused, shall be lamented, pitied, and excused of every hearer, for it so falls out, that we, what we have we prize not to the worth, whilst we enjoy it, but being lacked and lost. Why, then we rack the value, then we find the virtue that possession would not show us. Whilst it was ours, so will it fare with Claudio. When he shall hear she died upon his words, the idea of her life shall sweetly creep into a study of imagination. And every lovely organ of her life shall come apparelled in more precious habit, more moving, delicate, and full of life into the eye and prospect of his soul. That when, then when she lived indeed, then shall he mourn, if ever love had interest in his liver, and wish he had not so accused her. No, though he thought his accusation line, true, accusation true, let this be so, and doubt not but success will fashion the event in better shape than I can lay it down in likelihood. But if all aim and this be leveled false, the supposition, supposition of the lady's death will quench the wonder of her infamy. And if it sort not well, you may conceal her, as best befits her wounded reputation in some reclusive and religious life, out of all eyes, tongues, minds, and injuries. Signor Leonato, let the friar advise you. And though you know my inwardness in love is very much unto the prince and Claudio, yet by mine honor I will deal in this as secretly and justly as your soul should with your body. Being that I flow in grief, the smallest twine may then lead me. Tis well consented, presently away. For to strange sores, strangely, they strain this cure. Come, lady, die to live. This wedding day perhaps is but prolonged. Have patience and endear. <sighs> lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. How much might the man deserve of me that would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way, but no such friend. May a man do it? It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is that not strange? As strange as the thing I know not. It were as possible for me to say, I loved nothing so well as you, but believe me not. And yet I lie not. I confess nothing, oh no, I deny nothing. I'm sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat it that says I lot love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised to it. I protest, I love thee. Why then, God forgive me. What offense, sweet Beatrice? You have stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. <laughs> and do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. <sighs> Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. Ha! Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Jerry, sweet Beatrice. I'm gone. Though I'm here, there is, a, there is no love in you. Nay, I pray you, let me go. Beatrice. In faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. Be there easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy? Is Claudio thine enemy? 
Is he not approved in the height of villain that has slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man. What? Bear her in hand until they come to take hands and then with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor. Oh God, that I were a man. I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Hear me, Beatrice. Talk with a man out at a window, a proper saying. Nay, but Beatrice. Sweet hero, she is wrong, she is slandered, she is undone. Beatrice. Princes and counties. Surely a princely testimony, a goodly count. Count Comfact, a sweet gallant, Shirley. Oh, that I were a man for his sake, or that I had any friend would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into courtesies, valor into compliment, and men are only turned into tongue and trim ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules, that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Terry, good Beatrice, by this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you, in your soul, the Count Claudio hath wronged, hero? Nay, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. <sighs> Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand. And so I leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go, comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. And so, farewell. Scene two, a prison. Is our whole assembly appeared? Oh, a store and a cushion for the sexton. Which be the male factors? Marry that I am and my partner. Nay, that's certain. We have the exhibition to examine. But which are the offenders that ought to be examined? Let them come before Master Constable. Yay, Mary, let them come before what me. What is your name, friend? This uh, right there. Baraccio. Pray write down Baraccio, yours, sir. I'm a gentleman, sir. My name is Conrad. Write down Master Gentleman Conrad. Master, do you serve God? Yes, sir, we hope. Write down that they hope they serve God, and write God first, for God defend, but God should go before such villains. Masters, it is proved already that you are little better than false knaves, and it will go near to be thought so shortly. How answer you for yourselves? Mary, sir, we say we are none. Ah, a marvelously witty fellow, I assure you. But I will go about with him. Come you hither, sir, a word in your ear, sir. I say to you, it is thought you are false knaves. Sir, I, I, I say to you, we are none. Well, stand aside, for God, they are both in a tale. Have you written down that they are none? Master Constable, you go not the way to examine. You must call forth the watch that are the accusers. Yea, Mary, that's the effest way. Let the watch come forth. Masters, I charge you in the prince's name, accuse these men. This man said, sir, that John John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down Prince John a villain. Why is this flat perjury to call prince brother a villain? Uh, Master Constable, I... Pray thee, fellow peace, I do not like thee look, I promise thee. What heard you him say else? Mary that he had received a thousand ducats from Don John for accusing the lady here wrongfully. But that burglary is ever was committed. Yea, by must that it is. What else, fellow? And that Count Claudio did mean, upon his words, to disgrace Hero before the entire assembly and not marry her. Oh, villain, thou will be condemned to everlasting redemption for this. What else? This is all. Then you can deny. Prince John is this morning secretly stolen away. Hero was in this manner accused and in this very manner refused, and upon the grief of this suddenly died. Master Constable, let these men be bound and brought to Leonato's. I will go before and show him 
Come, let them be opinioned. Let them be in the hands. Off, coxcomb. That's my life. Where's the sexton? Let him write down the prince's officer coxcomb. Come, bind them. Thou naughty varlet. Away. You are an ass. You are an ass. Dost not thou suspect my place? Dost thou not suspect my years? Oh, that he were here to write me down an ass. But masters, remember that I am an ass. Though it not be written down, yet forget not that I am an ass. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety. I shall be proved upon thee by good witness. I am a wise fellow, and which is more an officer, and which is more a householder, and which is more as pretty a piece of flesh as any in Messina, and one that knows the law go to, and a rich enough fellow go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath two gowns and everything handsome about him. Bring him away, oh, that I have been writ down an ass! Act Five, Scene One, Before Leonato's House. You go on thus, you will kill yourself. And tis not wisdom thus to second grief against yourself. I pray thee, cease thy counsel, which falls upon my, into mine ears as profitless as water in a sieve. Give not me counsel, nor let no comforter delight mine ear, but such a one whose wrongs do suit with mine. Bring me a father that so loved his child, whose joy of her is overwhelmed like mine, and bid him speak of patience. Measure his woe, the length and breadth of mine, and let it answer every strain, for as for strain, as thus for thus, and such a grief for such, in every liniment, branch, shape, and form. If such a one will smile and stroke his beard, Bid sorrow wag, cry, him when he should grow. Patch grief with proverbs, make mixed fortune drunk with candle wasters. Bring him yet to me, and I of him will gather patience. But there is no such man. But brother, men can counsel and speak comfort to that grief which they themselves not feel. But tasting it, their counsel turns to passion which before would give perceptual medicine to rage, that a strong madness in a silken thread, charm ache with air and agony with words. No, no, tis all men's office to speak patience to those and ring under the load of sorrow. But no man's virtue, nor sufficiency to be so moral when he shall endure the like himself. Therefore give me no counsel. My griefs cry louder than advertisements. Therein do men from children nothing dither. I pray thee peace. I will be fresh and blood, for there was never yet philosopher that could endure the toothache patiently. However, they have writ the style of gods and made it push at chance and sufferance. Yet bend not all the harm upon yourself. Make those that do offend you suffer too. And there thou speakest reason. Nay, I will do so. My soul doth tell me that Hero is belied, and that shall Claudio know, so shall the prince, and all of them that doth dishonor her. Here comes the prince and Claudio hastily. Then? Then? Good day to both of you. Hear you, my lords. We have some haste, Leonardo. Some haste, my lord. Well, fare you well, my lord. Are you so hasty now? Well, all is one. Nay, do not quarrel with us, good old man. Ah, if he could right himself with quarreling, some of us would lie low. Who wrongs him? Mary, thou dost wrong me. Thou dissembler thou. Nay, never lay thy hand upon thy sword. I fear thee not. Mary, beshrew my hand if it should give your age such cause to fear. In faith, my hand meant nothing to my sword. Tush, tush, man! Never fleer and jest at me! Oh, I speak not like a dotard nor a fool, as on the privilege of age to brag. Well, I have done being young, or oh, what would do were I not old? 
no, Claudio, to thy head. Thou hast so wronged mine innocent child, and me that I am forced to lay my reverence, my and with gray hair as a bruise of many days, to challenge thee to trial of a man. I say thou hast belied mine innocent child. Thy slander has gone through and through her heart, and she lies buried with her ancestors. Oh, in a tomb where never scandal slept, save this of hers, framed by thy villainy. My villainy. Thine, Claudio, thine, I say. You say not right, old man. Oh, my lord, my lord, I'll prove it on his body if he dare, despite his nice fence and his active practice. It's May of youth and bloom of lustyhood. Away, I will have naught to do with you. Canst thou so damn me? Thou hast killed my child. That thou killest me, boy, oh, thou shalt kill a man. He shall kill two of us, and men indeed. But that's no matter. Let him kill one first. Win me and wear me. Let him answer me. Come, follow, boy. Come, sir boy. Come, follow me. Sir boy, I'll whip you from your foining fence. Nay, as a gent, I am a gentleman, I will. Brother. Content yourself. God knows I loved my niece, and she is dead, slandered to death by villains that dare as well as answer a man indeed, as I dare take a serpent by the tongue. Boys, apes, braggarts, jacks, milksops. Brother Antony. Hold your content. What, man? I know them, yea, and what they weigh, even to the utmost scruple, scrambling, outfacing, fashion-munging boys that lie and cog and flout, deprave and slander, go antically, show outward hideousness, and speak off a half a dozen dangerous words, how they might hurt their enemies if they durst, and this is all. But brother Anthony. Come, tis no matter. Do not you meddle, let me deal in this. Gentlemen, oh, we will not wait your patience. My heart is sorry for your daughter's death, but on my honor, she was charged with nothing but what was true and very full of proof. Ah, oh, my lord! I will not hear you. No? Come, brother, away. I will be heard. And shall, or some of us will smart for it. See, see. <laughs> ah, here comes the man we went to seek. No, senor, what news? Good day, my lord. Welcome, senor. You were almost come to part almost afraid. We'd like to have our two noses snapped off with two men without teeth. Leonardo and his brother. What thinkest thou? <laughs> Had we fought, I doubt we should have been too young for them. In a false quarrel there is no true valor. I came to seek you both. We have been up and down to seek thee, for we are high-proof melancholy and would have fain have it beaten away. Wilt thou use thy wit? It is in my scabbard. Shall I draw it? Dost thou wear thy wit by thy side? Never any did so, though very many have been beside their wit. I will bid thee draw as we do the minstrels. Draw to pleasure us. As I am an honest man, he looks pale. Art thou sick or angry? What? Courage, man! What though care killed a cat, thou hast meddle enough in thee to kill care. Sir, I shall meet your wit in the career, and you charge it against me. I pray you, choose another subject. Nay, then, give him another staff. The last one was broke cross. By this light, he changes more and more. I think he be angry indeed. If he be, he knows how to turn his girdle. Shall I speak a word in your ear? God bless me from a challenge. You are a villain. I just not. I will make it good how you dare, with what you dare and when you dare. Do me right, or I will protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady, and her death shall fall heavy on you. Let me hear from you. Well, I will meet you, so I may have good cheer. What? A feast? 
<laughs> Faith, I thank him. He hath bid me to a calf's head upon a capon, the which, if I do not carve most curiously, say my knife's not. Shall I not find a woodcock too? Sir, your wit ambles well. It goes easily. I'll, I'll tell thee how Beatrice praised thy wit the other day. I said, thou hadst a fine wit. True, said she, fine little one. No, said I, a great wit. Right, says she, a great gross one. Nay, said I, a good wit. Just, said she, it hurts nobody. Nay, said I, the gentleman is wise. Certain, said she, a wise gentleman. Nay, said I. He hath the tongues that I believe, she said, for he swore a thing to me on Monday night, which he forswore on Tuesday morning. There's a double tongue. There's two tongues. Thus did she, an hour together, transhape thy particular virtues. Yet at last she concluded with a sigh, thou wast the properest man in Italy. For which she wept heartily and said she cared not. Yea, that she did. But yet for all that, and she did not hate him deadly, she would love him dearly. The old man's daughter told us all. All, all, and moreover, God saw him when he was hid in the garden. But when shall we set these savage bull's horns on the sensible Benedict's head? Hmm? Yea, and the text underneath, here dwells Benedict, the married man. Fare you well, boy. You know my mind. I will leave you now to your gossip-like humor. You break jests as bra braggarts do their blades, which God be thanked hurt not. My lord, for your many courtesies, I thank you. I must discontinue your company. Your brother the bastard is fled from Messina. You have among you killed a sweet and innocent lady. For my lord Lackbeard there, he and I shall meet. Until then, peace be with him. He's in earnest. In most profound earnest, and I'll warrant you for the love of Beatrice. And hath challenged thee. Most sincerely. What a pretty thing man is when he goes in his doublet and hose and leaves off his wit. He is then a giant to an ape, but then is an ape a doctor to such a man. Good soft youth. Let me be. Buck up my heart and be sad. Did he not say my brother was fled? Come you, sir, if justice cannot tame you, she shall never weigh more reasons in her balance. Nay, and you should be a cursing hypocrite once ye must be looked to. Oh no, two of my brother's men bound, ratio one. Hearken after their offense, my lord. Officers. What offense have these men done? Marry, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken untruth. Secondarily, they are slanderers. Sixth and lastly, they have belied a lady. Thirdly, they have verified unjust things, and to conclude, they are lying knaves. Uh-huh. Oh. First, I ask thee what they have done. Thirdly, I ask what's their offense. Sixth and lastly, why are they committed? And to conclude, what you lay to their charge. Rightly reasoned in his, in his own division. By my troth, there's one meaning well suited. Why have you offended, masters, that you are thus bound to your answer? This learned constable is too cunning to be understood. What's your offense? Sweet prince, uh, let me go no farther to mine answer. Uh, it, it, do you hear me? And let this count kill me. I have deceived even your very eyes. What your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools have brought to life, who in the night, overhearing me confessing to this man, how Don John, your brother, incensed me to slander Lady Hero, how you were brought into the orchard and saw me court Margaret in hero's garments, how you disgraced her and 
And when you would marry her, my villainy they have upon record, which I had rather seal with my death than repeat over to my shame. The lady is dead upon my and, and my master's false accusations. And briefly, I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. Runs not this speech like iron through your blood? I have drunk poison whilst he uttered it. Did my brother set thee on to this? Yea, and paid me richly for the practice of it. He was composed and framed of treachery, and fled he is upon this villainy. Sweet hero, now thy image doth appear in the rare semblance that I loved it first. Come, bring away the plaintiffs. By this time our sextant hath reformed Signor and Leonardo of the matter. And masters, do not forget to specify when the time and place shall serve that I am an ass. Here, here comes master Signor Leonardo and the sextant too. Which is the villain? Let me see his eyes, that when I note another man like him, I may avoid him. Which of these is he? If, if you should know your wronger, look on me. Art thou the slave that with thy breath hath killed mine innocent child? Yea, even I alone. No, not so, villain. Thou beliest thyself. Here stand a pair of honorable men. The third is fled that had a hand in it. I thank you, princes, for my daughter's death, recorded with your high and worthy deeds. Twas bravely done, if you bethink you of it. I know not how to pray your patience, yet I must speak. Choose your revenge yourself, impose me to whatever penance your invention can lay upon my sin, yet I sinned but in mistaking. By my soul, nor I. Yet to satisfy this good old man, I would bend under any heavy weight that he'll enjoin me to. I cannot bid you don't my daughter live. That were impossible. But I pray you both, Possess the people in Messina here, how innocent she died. And if your love can labor aught in sad invention, hang her an epithet upon her tomb and sing it to her bones. Sing it tonight. Tomorrow morning, come you to my house, and since you could not be my son-in-law, be yet my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, Almost a copy of my child that's dead, and she alone is heir to both of us. Give her the right you should have given her cousin, and so dies my revenge. O oh, noble sir, your overkindness doth wring tears from me. I do embrace your offer and dispose henceforth of poor Claudio. Tomorrow then I will expect your coming. Tonight I take my leave. This naughty man shall face to face be brought to Margaret who I believe was packed in all this wrong, hired to it by your brother. Uh, no, uh, by my soul, uh, she was not, uh, nor knew not what she did when she spoke to me, but, but always hath been just and, and virtuous in, in anything that I do know by her. Moreover, sir, which is indeed not under white and black, this point appeared, the offender did call me an ass. I beseech you, let it be remembered in his punishment. And also the watch heard them talk of one deformed. They say, beware the key in his ear and a lock hanging by it, and borrows money in God's name, the which he hath used so long and never paid, that now men grow hard-hearted and will lend nothing for God's sake. Pray you, examine him upon this point. I thank thee for thy care and honest pains. Your worship speaks like a most thankful and reverent youth, and I praise God for you. There's for thy pains. God save the foundation. Go, I discharge thee of thy prisoner, and I thank thee. I leave an iron knave with your worship, which I beseech your worship to correct yourself. For the example of others, God keep your worship. I wish your worship well. God restore you to health. I humbly give you leave to depart. And if a merry meeting may be wished, God prohibit it. Come, neighbor. 
Until tomorrow morning, lords. Farewell. Farewell, my lords. We look for you tomorrow. We will not fail. Tonight I'll mourn with Hero. Bring you these fellows on. We'll talk with Margaret, how her acquaintance grew with this lewd fellow. Scene two, Leonato's Garden. Pray thee, sweet mistress Margaret, deserve well at my hands by helping me to the speech of Beatrice. Will you then write me a sonnet in praise of my beauty? Oh, in so high a style, Margaret, that no man living shall ever come over it, for in most comely truth thou deservest it. To have no man come over me, why, shall I always keep below stairs? Thy wit is as quick as the greyhound's mouth, it catches. And yours as blunt as the fencer's foils, which hit but hurt not. A most manly wit, Margaret. It will not hurt a woman. And so, I pray thee, call Beatrice, I give thee the bucklers. Give us the swords. We have bucklers of our own. <laughs> if you use them, Margaret, you must put it in the pikes with the vice, and they are dangerous weapons for maids. Well, I will call Beatrice to you, who I think hath legs. And therefore will come. <sighs> The God of love that sits above and knows me and knows me how pitiful I deserve. Ah, I mean in singing, but in loving. Leander the good swimmer, Troilus the first employer of panders, and the whole bookfold of these quantum carpet mongers whose names yet run smoothly in the even road of a blank verse, why they were never so truly turned over and over as poor, my poor self in love. Mary, I cannot show it in rhyme, I have tried. <laughs> and I can find no, out no rhyme to lady but baby, an innocent rhyme. And for scorn, horn, a hard rhyme. And for school, fool, a babbling rhyme. Ugh, very ominous endings. No, I was not born under a rhyming planet, nor I could not woo in festival terms. Oh, sweet Beatrice, wouldst thou come when I called thee? Yea, senor, and depart when you bid me. Oh, stay but till then. Then is spoken. Fare you well now, and yet... Ere I go, let me go with that I came, which is, with knowing, what hath passed between you and Claudio. Only foul words, and thereupon I will kiss thee. Foul words is but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is noisome. Therefore I will depart unkissed. Thou hast frighted the word out of his right sense, so forcible is thy wit. But I must tell thee plainly. Claudio undergoes my challenge, and either I must shortly hear from him, or I will subscribe him a coward. And I pray thee now, tell me for which of my bad parts didst thou first fall in love with me? For them all together, which maintain so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them. But for which of my good parts parts did you first suffer love for me suffer love <laughs> hey good epithet i do suffer love indeed for i love thee against my will in spite of your heart i think alas poor heart if you spite it for my sake i will spite it for yours for i will never love that which my friend hates and thou and i are too wise to woo peaceably it appears not in this confession there's not one wise man among twenty that will praise himself. An old, an old instance, Beatrice, that lived in the lime of good neighbors. If a man do not erect in this age his own tomb ere he dies, he shall live no longer in monument than the bell rings and the widow weeps. And how long is that, think you? Question. Why, 
an hour in clamor and a quarter in room. Therefore, it is most expedient for the wise, if Don Worm his conscience find no impediment to the contrary, to be the trumpet of his own virtues, as I am to myself. So much for praising myself, who I myself will bear witness is praiseworthy. And now tell me, how doth your cousin? Very ill. And how do you? Very ill, too. Serve God, love me, and mend. There will I leave you, too, for here comes one in haste. Madam, you must come to your uncle, yonder's old coil at home, that did pr prove my lady hero hath been falsely accused. The prince and Claudio mightily abused, and Don John is an, an author of all who is fed and gone. Will you come presently? Will you go hear this news, senor? I will live in thy heart and die in thy lap and be buried in thy eyes. And moreover, I will go with thee to, the, to thy uncles. Scene three, a church. Is this the monument of Leonardo? It is, my lord. Done to death by slanderous tongues was the hero that here lies. Death in guerdon of her wrongs gives her fame which never dies. So the life that died with shame lives in death and glorious fame. Now unto thy bones good night, yearly will I do this right. Good morrow, masters. Put your torches out. The wolves have prayed and looked a gentle day. Before the wheels of Phoebus, round about dapples the drowsy east with spots of grey. Thanks to you all, and leave us very well. Good morrow, masters. Each his several way. Come, let us hence and put on other weeds. And then to Leonardo's we will go. And Hyman now with luckier issue speed than this for whom we rendered up this woe. Scene four, a room in Leonardo's house. Did I not tell you she was innocent? So are the prince and Claudio who accused her upon the error that you heard debated. But Margaret wasn't some fault for this, although against her will, as it appears, in the true course of all the question. Well, I am glad that all things sort so well. And so am I, being else by faith and forced to call young Claudio to a reckoning for it. Well, daughter, and you gentlewomen all, we're drawn to a chamber by yourselves. And when I send for you, come hither masked. The prince and Claudio promised by this hour to visit me. You know your office, brother. You must be father to your brother's daughter and give her to young Claudio. Which I will do with confirmed countenance. Friar, I must entreat your pains, I think. To do what, senor? To bind me or undo me, one of them. <laughs> senor Leonardo, the truth is, good senor, your niece regards me with an eye of favor. That I, my daughter, lent her, tis most true. And I do with an eye of love requite her. The sight whereof I think you had from me, from Claudio and the prince, but what your will? Your answer, sir, is enigmatical. But for my will, my will is your good will may stand with ours this day to be conjoined in the state of honorable marriage. In which, good friar, I shall desire your help. My heart is with your liking. And my help. Here comes the prince and Claudio. Good morrow to this fair assembly. Good morrow, prince. Good morrow, Claudio. We here attend you. Are you yet determined today to marry with my brother's daughter? I'll hold my mind. Call her forth, brother. Here's the friar ready. Good morrow, Benedict. Why, what's the matter that you have such a February face, so full of frost, storm, and cloudiness? I think he thinks upon the savage bull. Tush, fear not, man. 
will tip thy horns with gold, and all Europa shall rejoice at thee, as once Europa did at Lusty Jove when he did play the noble beast in love. Bull Jove, sir, had an amiable low, and some such strange bull leaped your father's co, and got half a, got a calf in that same noble feet, much like to you, for you have just his bleat. <laughs> for this one I owe you. Here comes other reckonings. Uh, which is the lady I must seize upon? The same is she, and I do give you her. Why, then she's mine. Sweet, let me see your face. No, that you shall not, till you take her hand before this fire and swear to marry her. Give me your hand. Before this holy friar, I am your husband, if you like of me. And when I lived, I was your other wife. And when you loved me, you were my other husband. Another hero? <laughs> Nothing certainer. One hero died defiant. But I do live, and surely as I live, I am a maid. No more hero. Hero that is dead. She died, my lord, but whilst her slander live. All this amazement can I qualify, when after that the holy rites are ended. I'll tell you largely of fair hero's death. Meantime, let wonder seem familiar, and to the chapel let us presently. Soft and fair, friar. Which is Beatrice? I answer to that name. What is your will? Do not you love me? Why, no. No more than reason. Why, then your uncle and the prince and Claudio have been deceived. They swore you did. Do not you love me? Troth, no. No more than reason. Why, then my cousin Margaret and Ursula are much deceived. For they did swear you did. They swore that you were almost sick for me. They swore that you were well nigh dead for me. Tis no such matter. Then you do not love me. No, truly, but in friendly recompense. Come, cousin, I'm sure you love the gentleman. And I'll be sworn upon it that he loves her, for here's a paper written in his hand, a halting <laughs> sonnet of his own pure brain, fashioned to Beatrice. <laughs> and here's another writ in my cousin's hand, stolen from her pocket, containing her affection to Benedict. <laughs> a miracle. Here's our own hands against our hearts. Come. I will have thee, but by this light I take thee for pity. I would not deny you, but by this good day, I yield upon great persuasion, and partly to save your life, for I was told you were in a consumption. Peace, I will stop your mouth. How dost thou, Benedict, married man? I'll tell thee what, Prince. A college of witcrackers cannot flout me of my humor. Dost thou think I care for a satire or an epigram? No. If a man will be beaten with brains, he shall wear nothing handsome about him. In brief, since I do purpose to marry, I will think nothing to any purpose than the world can say against it. And therefore, never flout at me for what I have said against it. For man is a giddy thing, and this is my conclusion. For thy part, Claudio. I did think to have beaten thee, but in that thou art like to be my kinsman, live unbruised, and love my cousin. I had well hoped thou wouldst have denied Beatrice that I might have cudgelled thee out of thy single life to make thee a double dealer, which out of question thou wilt be if my cousin dost not look exceedingly narrowly to thee. Come, come, we are friends. Let's have a dance ere we are married, that we may lighten our own hearts and our wives' heels. We'll have dancing afterward. First of my word. Therefore play, music. Prince, thou art sad. Get thee a wife. Get thee a wife. There is no staff more reverend than one tipped with horn. My lord, your brother John is taken in flight and uh, brought with our men back to Messina. Ah, think not on him till tomorrow. I'll devise thee brave punishments for him. Strike up, pipers! <laughs> 